Thank you uh, for waiting patiently. Uh, if you've been attending uh, workshops so far this week, you have seen this slide before. Um, it is our way of acknowledging that we are presenting, attending, and hosting this workshop from land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. As a land-based organization, we want to encourage everyone to learn more about the people who inhabited the land prior to European colonization and who are still here today. One way to begin that process and journey is going to the link provided to learn about the history of the land you occupy and manage and to find additional learning resources um, through, through that website. Um, and, and Jesse will drop, drop that into the chat. Uh, we owe so much of what we know about how to grow food and manage land in a way that is regenerative and ecologically responsible to the people who were here before European colonization and also to the people who were brought to the US as slaves. We encourage folks to learn about the ongoing history of black exclusion from property and farmland ownership and to support local black and indigenous groups as part of your environmental and land-based work. Some suggested ways for doing that are um, listed in the slide. I think we all, ooh, I think we all know this after uh, this last year, but I'm going to go over Zoom etiquette anyway. Um, this account is set to mute participants uh, upon entry. So when uh, you'd like to speak or ask a question, you can uh, just press the microphone button on your screen. Uh, please mute, mute yourself when you're done speaking to avoid background noise and interfering with other speakers. Um, and please feel free to use the chat feature to comment or ask questions at any point during the workshop. We'll be monitoring it throughout. Uh, and there will also be some opportunities to do Q&A. Uh, and please note, of course, that the session is being recorded. This conference is uh, made possible by our generous sponsors. Uh, so we'd like to acknowledge them now. Uh, again, this conference would not be possible without them. So we encourage you to support their businesses. And when you do, um, to let them know that you are so happy that they support uh, NOFA Mass. Uh, we also have an online auction that I think is ending either today or tomorrow. So I, uh, you should hop on over there after, um, after the workshop and check out some of the really cool things that are posted there. And then um, uh, you can also head over to our virtual vendor marketplace. Uh, many of these folks also support Nova Mass. So um, please give them your business. Okay, uh, so with that um, introduction, I would like to introduce our presenters for tonight. Uh, Alexis Alexander supports peer collaboration efforts and provides technical assistance for the neighboring Food Co-op Association, and Bonnie Hudspeth leads cooperative development for the same organization. The neighboring Food Co-op Association, or NFCA, is a cooperative federation of more than 40 food co-ops and startup initiatives with a combined membership of more than 164,000 people across New England and New York. NFCA supports growth, innovation, and shared success among their member food co-ops in the Northeast United States. With that, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much for presenting tonight. Well, hey, thanks for hosting NOFA friends and a round of applause for all the work and logistics. It's not as fun to plan a virtual conference, I'm imagining. And to the participants, Welcome. We'd love to see your beautiful faces if you're in a space that you feel comfortable sharing so we can see each other, um, make give each other thumbs up. <laughs> oh, yay. Hi, Joan. Thumbs up. Um, and I was curious, maybe through reactions, if I can't see your faces, but is are any of you farmers? Thumbs up. Oh, hi, Carol. Carol's not a farmer. Uh, thumbs up if you're a farmer. What about a backyard grower? Yeah. Yeah. What about an eater? Yeah, you're eaters. Okay, good. Um, does anyone here work for food access or advocacy work? Yeah. Okay. Cool. I volunteer. I volunteer for NOFA New Hampshire. Oh, nice. I'm on the board for about 13 years. Thank you for your board service, Joan. And I love Food Alliance. I love what those those folks are doing at Food Alliance. Ooh. I'm I'm going to help at a giving garden at a retreat center Saturday. Cool. Thanks, Carol. Welcome. And Kevin and EY iPhone. I don't know you two, <laughs> but we can. We're so glad that you're here as well. Um, hopefully, we get to see you at some point. So. Um, are you committed? I guess the question is, are you committed to building a healthy and more inclusive and just food system in our region? Thumbs up. 
to that. Okay, yes, we're all in this together. Great, this is a great place to spot. So um, we're, uh, Alexis, we can see your notes. So if you wanna switch it over to the other screen, we can. That's odd because that's not what I'm seeing. So let me see, I might okay. have the, um, can you stop the share? And let me try this yeah. again. And I'll share our takeaways while Alexis is getting our PowerPoint pulled up, which is like our plan this evening is really digging into the co-op model a little bit and also to share some stories of how our food co-ops in our region are working to make healthy local food more um, available to everyone. And they're also stories about how we're partnering with farmers to build a more inclusive and healthy and just food system that works for everyone. And so tonight, feel free to ask questions if they come up or post them in the chat. And we want this to be as inter interactive as possible within reason. So um, we'd love, love, you to, love to hear from you. Stop us if we're going too fast. Stop us if you're like, wait, what's that? Or that's juicy, dig into that more. Bonnie, do you still see the notes? I think I figured nope, it out. It looks all great. Yeah, wait, if you wait. want to advance to meet the cooperators, yeah. Meet the cooperators. You heard a little brief introduction about Alexis and I. Um, and Alexis, do you want to share a little bit more about what you are doing and what you did? Sure. Right now, um, I recently joined NFCA and I work with peer collaboration and technical support, doing a lot of work in um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and healthy food access for NFCA. Um, prior to that, I was the membership manager at Green Star uh, Co-op um, for 11 years. And besides just doing basically a membership activity, I also helped to spearhead a um, healthy food access program called FLOWER, which was a need-based uh, discount program. So we'll be talking some about that tonight a little bit. Great, thank you. And I lead cooperative development for the Neighboring Food Co-op Association. And we do a lot of peer learning and shared uh, innovation. And um, I also serve as the board vice president for Cooperative Fund of New England. Some of y'all may be familiar with them. Um, and before coming to Neighboring Food Co-op Association, I served as the startup project manager to open the Monadnock Food Co-op in Keene, New Hampshire. Um, and I also was a farm worker on a number of farms. So glad to have those experiences to lend me here today. So, um, these guys have made our job so much easier talking about the cooperative model of business because, I mean, when I look at this picture, I just hear villain cackling. Um, it's, it, the, you know, our traditional economic system is not working well for most of us and the planet, right? It might be working for these two, but that's not really what it's about. And so when we think about our current... <laughs> economic system, I think Leah Penniman from Soulfire Farm, she really powerfully summed it up in this article on Black Earth Wisdom. I'll post it in the chat, but she's basically, she said like, in this time, we are acutely aware of the fractures in our system of runaway consumption and corporate insatiability. We feel the hot winds of wildfire, the disruptions of pandemic and the choked breath of the victims of state violence. We know there's no going back to normal. The path forward demands that we take our rightful place as the younger siblings in creation, deferring to the oceans, forests, and mountains as our teachers. That sums up really well, kind of some of the things that you'll see on the slide. Um, and I would also add versus thinking that powerful, wealthy people outside of our communities are gonna help us solve problems, also deferring to ourselves, to our neighbors, um, to, uh, to knowing what we need and working together to create collective solution. Next, please. So what if there was an alternative economic system to this? What if there was an alternative that was democratic, that was accountable to us, the people it served versus billionaires? What if it was rooted in our communities and part of a values-based movement? What if it put people before profit? That would be a good start. Was flexible, innovative, successful, accessible to all of us and tested and proven. And the good news is there is, there is an alternative, cooperatives. 
um, food co-ops are structured and well positioned and all types of cooperatives are positioned to help communities and our country build a resilient alternative to our current economic system because they build on local skills and assets and they help us as a as me as an individual i would never be able to open a multi million dollar business but i'm one member owner at my local food co-op for under $200 for my family of this multi million dollar enterprise so it allows people to pool limited resources for scale and impact that we could never have by ourselves, which is directly related to building an economy that's inclusive for all of us through community ownership and accountability. And, you know, co-ops also anchor wealth in our communities because profits are not, not only the local sales are going directly to farmers, profits are distributed and given back to members by, based on how much they use the co-op. So yay, we have an alternative, that's the good news. But I want to talk a little bit about more about what is a cooperative. Um, so the International Cooperative Alliance defines cooperatives as people-centered enterprises jointly owned and democratically controlled by and for their members to realize their common socioeconomic needs and aspirations. Okay, that sounds gravy, but it's very intellectual and lots of words. So who can, is anyone willing to post in the chat or unmute yourself to tell me like, you're sitting next to Uncle Frank or Cousin Frank at Thanksgiving. What, how would you describe to Uncle Frank what a co-op is? Anyone? Post in the chat. No, you're going to make me define it. You're going to make me tell Uncle Frank. Okay. No one wants to. <laughs> no one wants to take a, a yeah, dabble. Um, that's oh, Joan. Joan, what would you say? What is a co-op? Um, well, I guess I would say that at least I have a voice. I have a vote, and I I don't have to be afraid to speak up because um, uh, you know it. I I I've enrolled myself in this group, and my my voice should be respected and and at least um. Uh, honored, you know, like explore my opinion, you know, don't say no and move on. So, um, but I must admit that there's a co-op in Concord that has not joined the, you know, the cooperative alliance. And, and I was going to ask you that later on. So I, I have not joined that co-op on because of that main reason, but I'm diverging. Um, but I have been to the Monadnock co-op. I've been to the Brattleboro co-op. I, you know, I, I, I love co-ops and I, uh anyway i don't know if yeah. i answered your question that that's great and I, my voice my voice should count great yeah your voice should count your that that cooperatives you know you think about how other um sole proprietorship businesses or publicly traded businesses if you're a millionaire you would have access to many more votes than if you own one share in the corporation, right? In a cooperative, it's one member, one vote. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are. And so that's huge. And when it comes to what you said, your voice and, and voice is accountability, right? So that's a great way to describe it to Uncle Frank because it show, you know, that's a, <laughs> I love that story, your voice and your vote. Um, so yeah, you know, we own and control cooperatives together. That's the difference. And so if something ain't going well, like, for example, you want the co-op you shop at to join the neighboring food co-op association, tell them to. <laughs> we would love that. We'd love all co-ops to be in, in the region to be part of the neighboring food co-op association. Um, yeah. And what another thing that unites co-ops next, dear Alexis, is that all co-ops are values-based businesses. And so... Co-ops exist not to make the most profit as the ultimate goal, but to meet our unmet needs, right? And so all of our co-ops are based on the values of self-help, equity, equality, solidarity, democracy, and next, all co-ops across the globe adhere to and are guided by these same principles. There's seven cooperative principles, which is really amazing if you think about it. Um, there's a nice little graphic here of these cooperative principles. Imagine if all businesses were guided by even one of these common principles, like concern for community, 
right? It's pretty incredible. And it doesn't matter the type of cooperative. Cooperatives are a very flexible business model. So when I, you know, sometimes if I'm just saying co-op, I think food co-op in my head because I am part of a food co-op association. But the reality is that whether um, farmer co-ops, electric co-ops, food co-ops, dairy co-ops, credit unions, right? Financial co-ops. All co-ops have one thing in common, which is membership is open to everyone. Co-op membership and participation is without gender, social, racial, political, or religious discrimination. And in this time where our country and the world is driven by profit over putting the needs of us as people and our planet, our communities are able to take back our power by participating in existing co-ops or helping to create new ones that we own and control together, right? And a lot of, I mean, rural America would not have power, would not have electricity without cooperatives, without electric co-ops. Um, there are, the majority of farmers in this country are organized through cooperatives that allow them to market or purchase or supply things that they would not be able to as individuals if it were not for a cooperative structure. Are you gonna learn about co-ops in school? No, <laughs> we're trying to change that because they are more successful than privately owned corporations or publicly traded corporations. So, you know, for what, think about all the community infrastructure we could own collectively. So we cooperatively own our grocery stores and food co-ops as an example, means that we are taking control over what types of food our community has access to, where our food is coming from, like how much are we prioritizing sourcing from farmers? We're going to talk more about that. And also, where is our hard-earned money supporting? Who is it going to? So um, one thing that is interesting about cooperative history and co-op identity and purpose is that mutual aid is core to co-op purpose. Our food co-ops are more than just grocery stores. Um, and and to, if you want to start a new food co-op, which I was lucky enough to be in the process of, you do community organizing. And that's rooted in solidarity. It's not charity, right? It's not someone, we're going to figure out what they need. It's we are going to collectively figure out what we need. And we're all recognizing that we're all in this together. We all need nutritious food. The problem that we've identified is a collective problem. And so it's a situation that involves all of us. And so this also relates to another need that's a very deep need in our communities right now, which is how do we rehumanize each other so that we can work together to find solutions, right? Because we're really familiar and super fed up, at least in my case, with national leadership reliant on us divided and rely on us to humanize each other so that we can keep our country's capitalist racist systems in place, right? So that business as usual can keep happening. And yet we're hungry for alternatives. So many of us are hungry for alternatives. And so our, our co-ops are just one of the places in our community that are gathering places for us to come together in dialogue, helping ourselves and uh, creating spaces to build connections and rehumanizing each other. So. Glad that you all are part of this conversation. How do we rehumanize each other? Um, and so what does that what does that mutual aid look like? What does this look like in a business model? When profit's not your bottom line, but more a means to a greater end, it means you can do things like prioritizing sourcing from local farmers, right? And so through the neighboring food co-op association, we work together and just like me and as, as an individual can access things that I, you know, I, or doesn't have access to things that collectively I'm able to through my food co-op. When our food co-ops come together, we can do local sourcing projects because we can commit to buying a volume of locally grown fruits and vegetables that one co-op alone couldn't. Or we could work together with our collective brains to figure out how do we make healthy food more accessible to our whole community. So we're going to share more about that. Um, and so just in our region alone, the social and economic impacts of our food co-ops, that's helping to build a more just and more sustainable food system. So you can see a couple of examples, even during the pandemic, th these numbers are from last year's, our 40 food co-ops. Um, 
employ a significant amount of people in our region. Look at that, over $100 million of local product sales. That means money going directly into the pockets of farmers, local farmers and producers. And I know y'all understand this deeply. Control of our local food system matters so much, right? So our food co-ops create this vehicle for us to support local farmers all year round. You know, in addition to the farmers markets, the CSAs, the farm stands, um, building off that, having a year round stable market and our co-ops buy substantially more from local farmers and producers. So it just in our region, over a quarter and close to a third of sales come from local farmers and producers. Compare that to 2% of sales at supermarkets. 2% compared to, what is it, Alexis? It's like 25 to 30, a lot. Some of our co-ops are up to 40% from local farmers and producers. So being a stable and trusted year-round market and serving as an incubator space for new local products is one of the things that we're able to do when profit is not the bottom line, when relationships are the bottom line, right? When making sure our farmer is able to continue growing food that our shoppers are wanting to buy. So don't have no fear, we're gonna dig into, well, how do the co-ops do that? This is all great in theory, but what? I, I shop at a co-op and I don't know if they do these things. Okay, we'll talk about it. But first just acknowledging that right now, the pandemic, this third wave that we're in now, apparently, it's continuing to disproportionately impact individuals and communities. And we're, we're having this light shining on the fact that there's a lot of systemic crap that we got to fix, right? And there is also opportunity areas for us to organize cooperatively so that we can come together and reduce these negative impacts of the pandemic. But beyond just doing that, like, we have to rebuild, right? But we don't wanna rebuild stuff that is unjust, you know? We don't wanna rebuild injustices that have existed based on class, race, gender, sexual orientation, ability, right? So we and others in our communities, we're trying to figure out what we can do, how can we have influence and help? And we all know that the stronger our local food system is, the stronger and more resilient our communities are, and the more our communities will be able to weather storms in all forms, right? We're dealing with a number of different kinds of storms right now. So that, with that kind of background, let's dive deeper into how we can use our co-op model as part of our collective solution. So I'm gonna hand it over to my coworker, Alexis, to share more about what, what are we actually doing to meet unmet needs. Thanks, Bonnie. So a primary way the co-ops are combating injustices is through work specifically focused on healthy food access. You know, it's been really important for co-ops to recognize that healthy food access is more than simply providing a low-income discount program. It reflects people's ability to use our services, become involved in the co-op, and feel comfortable and safe in doing so. You know, getting a, like a true sense of belonging when they come to the co-op. So at the core, healthy food access is really about offering food security and collective ownership, and at the same time, being welcoming to all. And, you know, over, you know, the last several years, co-ops are really, food co-ops in particular, are really recognizing the need to ingrain, ingrain these concepts into their strategic visioning and mission and in all they do. And that's really consistent with our history as co-ops. You know, as Bonnie said earlier, there's centuries long history of mutual aid and cooperation. Um, and this really rings true when we look specifically at food security and collective ownership. Uh, Jessica Gordon Nemhard, who wrote the book Collective Courage, which is a history of the African-American co-op movement states that Throughout history, co-ops spring up in response to need, working toward the elimination of economic exploitation and social injustice. And what we see time after time again is during periods of heightened food insecurity and economic or social unrest, co-ops coming to the forefront. And an excellent case in point is looking in more recent history, just 
how food security was really at the heart of co-op movements over the past 175 years, the various waves of co-ops opening. Um, and all of these periods were difficult socioeconomic crises, which sparked renewed interest in foods co-ops, reinforcing that rich history of co-ops as a solution to achieve food security. And this really happened across demographic categories. Um, so in the Great Depression, you know, we see, you know, regional co-ops that we're familiar with, Hanover Food Co-op, Putney Food Co-op in Vermont, you know, in rural areas of New England, opening food co-ops to become more food secure. At the same time, co-ops were opening in urban areas, um, such as in Buffalo, New York, Citizens Co-op um, opened and Pure Co-op in Harlem. And both these co-ops opened in um, Black communities um, to meet their community's needs. And it wasn't just food co-ops that were fighting insecurity, right? Um, in the 60s, you know, we had the environmental movement going on, the civil rights movement, but then there was the failure of the family farms during this time and the big, you know, massive um, march on, uh, the tractor march on Washington. Um, and what we saw was a rise of far farmer co-ops and associations tackling issues of food insecurity like the Federation of so Co uh, Southern Cooperatives, who are really engaged in land retention and building wealth for Black farmers. More recently, the 2008 recession was the impotence for many of the co-ops that are beginning to open um, their doors um, now and in the past um, 10 years. So what we see is you know, we had after years of declining rates of food insecurity, um, because it reached a pinnacle in like about 2014, I believe, 11, I think it was. Um, and we started to see a, a rise to like 14%. And then it went down in 2019. And then I, I mean, I'm sorry, I kind of goofed that up, sorry. Um, it, went, it went high after 2008, and then in 2011, it started to come down, and it came down to 10.9% in 2019. And then it hit 13.9% in 2020 due to the pandemic, right? And so what we see is it's on the rise today. And it continue, continues to affect historically underserved and marginalized populations more than others. And this becomes really clear if we look at food insecurity disparity across race. So what we see here is um, 2019 food insecurity rates at 10.9% overall and then it goes up for people of color. And this was pre-COVID, and we know these numbers are different today, much higher. But one out of four Native American folks in 2019 were experiencing food insecurity. And it reinforces that addressing food insecurity in our communities can't be divorced from issues of social and economic injustice. And one primary way a co-op addresses these injustices is by ensuring the co-op is truly welcoming to all, which is consistent actually with our first cooperative principle. You know, as Bonnie had mentioned earlier, we have seven cooperative principles. And this first cooperative principle, you know, really talks about, you know, who joins and is welcome to the co-op. And essentially it's open to all persons and specifically without gender, social, racial, political, or religious discrimination. Co-ops are a means of combating the discrimination that leads to in food insecurity through being inclusive, which is inherent in our principles. And it was really interesting because the uh, International Cooperative Alliance still put out guidance notes from time to time on how to interpret our, our cooperative principles. And in 2016, they basically said that this first principle 
really imposes a duty on cooperatives to rise to the challenge of including all people in membership. It's an imperative for us to be non-discriminatory. So our work then centers on both socio-demographic as well as ec economic injustices. So by opening our doors and being truly welcome to all, co-ops have the ability to expose more members of our community to the fresh local goods of our local farmers, providing a critical link for local farmers to broaden their reach out into the community. So how are co-ops addressing food injustice? They're doing so in many ways, right? We're making sure that the demographics in our co-ops, members, staff, board, customers are reflective of the community at large that we're well-trained on implicit bias and intercultural development. We're offering affordable products, culturally inclusive products, making sure we're accessible to people with physical or, or social needs. And what's key in all of this is community partnerships. And what we're seeing is that our food co-ops are becoming increasingly engaged in this way. Partnerships are helping us determine how we can best change our practices, whether it be job recruitment and hiring, our materials, are they sensitive? Are they culturally appropriate? You know, training, member programming, so that we can more effectively engage with the entire community. And this work really focuses across socio-demographic groups, rage, age, gender identity, ethnicity, regardless of economic status. You know, we find that when there's a broad range of membership engagement, um, activities and community partnerships, it ensures awareness, equitable participation and inclusion in the co-op. So next we'll take a closer look at some of the strategies co-ops are using to enhance healthy food access, including programs that help to build um, food security for those fi uh, facing financial hardship across socio-demographic groups. So for over a decade, co-ops have launched healthy food access programs that increase the affordability of their products. And what we find is when we build more welcoming co-ops, the success of our healthy food access programs increases and they reach a broader audience. And this work also brings more local farm products into the hands of a greater diversity of members and customers. So when co-ops become more diverse, as I said before, will help increase the socio-demographic impact of our local farmers. So we're truly all working um, on this together. These initiatives, basically, we're gonna talk about some specific initiatives now, and they really um, kind of are broken down into three categories as we talk about them tonight. First are programs that are designed by our co-ops. Um, the second is the SNAP incentives programs that kind of started in farmers markets and are now um, going out into co-ops, groceries, CSAs, depending on the state. And then some unique partnerships that have been developed between co-ops and local farmers. So as far as programs designed by our co-ops, probably one of the more common ones known as far as food security goes are need-based discount programs. Um, a lot of these programs, the co-ops call them food for all. Some co-ops develop their own name for the programs. But basically, these are member programs that provide discounts, roughly 10 to 15 percent, um, to folks who are um, low income. And these programs basically run in the same way where what the co-ops do is they set up the program so if someone is on um, food established food assistance programs, SNAP, Medicaid, WIC, public assistance, you know, um, they'll qualify for the co-ops food for all program. Um, and typically a person's qualified for a year and then reapplies. Similar to that are membership for all programs. The membership for all programs are aimed at making the ability to join the co-op more accessible for folks. So it's kind of like a needs-based uh, program, but it's around the membership um, equity requirement. So um, 
what we do is uh, the co-ops have policies and programs in place to help make those memberships more affordable and accessible. The most common way is through installment payments. So for instance, my co-op here in Ithaca, New York has a requirement of $90 that you can pay all at once, or you can pay in installments of 10 and $5, which makes it really accessible for people to pay over time. Some co-ops now are going to what are called solidarity funds, and what these programs do is they actually provide a membership, either outright or in part. So the co-op will actually pay for part of a person's membership, and then the member will pay for the rest of it, or the co-op will pay for the whole membership. And these programs are funded through donations by individuals in the community, by community organizations. Um, and it's really meant to really help low-income people be able to access the co-op much more uh, readily. Some co-ops are extending this program to uh, also recognize historically um, marginalized groups, specifically people who identify as BIPOC. And um, they're doing this um, as a way uh, to not only have solidarity, but also in terms of reparations, recognizing the history of marginalization. Co-ops also do a lot in the way of education of members and consumers through in-store education and classes to increase the awareness of what co-ops are about, what we do, our relationships and farmers. Some co-ops have meet the farmer programs. Um, and a lot of co-ops include tours and cooking classes, and some of these are focused very specifically on making the co-op more accessible to people, um, such as classes like um, shopping on a budget, or how do you shop the bulk department if you're not familiar with all the various products in bulk. Um, there are also a lot of collaborations that are happening with local food security partners. Um, one of the popular programs our co-ops have are roundup programs at the registers. So if you go in and let's say spend $20.25, you can have the opportunity to, uh, rather than taking, and you pay with $21, you can put that 71 cents into the co-op's coffers. Um, I, I said that, oh boy, this is my night for doing things in reverse. Um, but anyway, that extra money, that 75 uh, cents would go into the Roundup program. So you're rounding up to the next dollar, essentially. And those donations go to local organizations um, and um, sometimes they go to fund the membership for all program. So this is a way that the folks in the, um, our members, our customers can really help support the community. We also do a lot in terms of food donations by customers or the co-op itself to our local food pantries. And the last program that's really designed by uh, co-ops and really, once again, like the needs-based discount program and membership for all are really focused on building food security is the basics program. This program was uh, founded in 2008 by a co-op and many co-ops started to adapt the program. And basically what it does is offers a selection of staple foods and household goods priced below suggest suggested retail. Um, and as I said, this program was created by co-ops, but then um, the National Co-op Grocers Association actually embraced the program and trademarked it and kind of standardized the program. So it's available now in um, co-ops affiliated with NCG so that when people may be traveling and go from one co-op to the other, they'll recognize the program as the same program. And the impact it had on our, uh, my co-op, which is Green Star in Ithaca, New York, is uh, with the uh, Food for All program, we found that a lot of people were telling us between those two programs, they found that they were really able to stretch their food dollar quite a bit. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, the impact of the need-based discount program on food access. Uh, so the program at uh, my co-op um, that I was membership manager at is called Flower, Fresh 
local, organic, within everyone's reach. And we began the work in 2010. And I reached out to the co-ops um, across the country to see who had such a, a needs-based discount program. And um, the biggest concentration was actually in the Northeast. And there were three co-ops in the region at that time that had food for all programs. And now 11 years later, there are 18 pro programs in our region. So 43% of our co-ops now offer a need-based program. And we have several co-ops that are actually working towards establishing uh, such a program in their co-op. Um, and what NFCA is doing in terms of supporting that work is we're, um, we conduct quarterly conference calls with our co-ops um, to talk about um, various food security programs, but specifically about food for all. And we provide material resources as well about how to set up a food for all program and to encourage and help other co-ops establish their own programs. And um, we also work towards helping uh, those with existing programs to innovate and grow their programs. And a lot of this work is done, as I said, through quarterly conference calls where co-ops are sharing with one another the information and the things that they've done and what they've learned so that we could all offer more effective programs. These programs serve over 4,300 uh, members. In 2020, they provided over $848,000 in discounts, which is amazing to think that during this pandemic, co-ops helped remove nearly a million dollars from the barriers to healthy food. Um, and also, we find that it increases participants' purchase power. Um, the flower, we did an analysis where what we saw is for people who had been current members in the co-op, when they joined flower, we looked at their spending the year before they were on flower and their first year on flower, and in an aggregate, that money increased. They spent more. And what they were telling us is, like I said before, you know, they, it stretched their food dollar and they found that they could buy more at Green Star. They could afford more and they didn't have to go to other stores. So this is also helping to keep um, our money local. And it also helps keep these programs sustainable over time, which is really important. And, you know, as these programs, you know, kind of grow and improve, we're also helping because we have so many um, sales that are local by local farms, by local producers. These programs also help um, improve our sales of those goods as well. Um, and we're always working to improve our programs. So, uh, especially in the area of how can we make these programs um, be more inclusive and keep growing successfully. So I wanna present two examples here tonight of co-ops who have done so quite successfully. Um, the first at Green Star, we were able to uh, improve our program by increasing participation of unrepresented groups. Um, and what we did specifically was between 2016 and 2020, we actually looked at who was part of the program, who was part of our co-op, and who wasn't part of our co-op? Who weren't we reaching effectively? And what we did is we pinpointed qualifiers to help us reach those folks. And so, you know, we, we wanted to improve access among students, among the elderly, among people with disabilities. So we added Pell Grant, um, so SSI, and SSDI. And then we partnered with community organizations um, to reach those groups that are even more invisible in our society, such as formerly incarcerated individuals, refugees, those with substance abuse orders. And we worked with those partners to get to kind of streamline the process for folks to qualify for the program. And what we thought, and then in 2020, we actually added. Um, unemployment as a direct response to COVID. And what we found is in that time period, we actually increased the percent of new members joining the co-op through the flower program from 42% to 46%, which meant 
the, the effectiveness of our outreach efforts were actually really successful and we were reaching a broader community. City Market increased their accessibility uh, in a couple of different ways. They held focus groups and they found out that while people loved the program and they were really grateful for it, they still found purchasing higher uh, quality, healthy foods such as um, fresh produce in bulk that they really wanted to buy those whole foods, it was still out of their reach. Um, and they were also intimidated by shop, shopping the bulk department. So what they did is change their discount structure to enhance the affordability of produce and bulk purchases. So those two categories have a 15% rather than a 10% discount. And then they created um, brochures on, on, for the stores, um, including bulk, with instructions on how to shop bulk, and store tours, which also included how to shop bulk. And then they partnered with um, a translation organization and some other community partners to determine the most common languages spoken in the Burlington, Vermont area. And they pinpointed five, language, five um, groups um, and they translated their print and online program materials into five uh, different languages. And we see this on the slide before, this is actually a shot of their website for their Food for All program. And we can see that they now offer their printed and website materials in Burmese, Spanish, Swahili, Nepali, and Somali, making it easier for people within those ethnic groups to be able to understand the co-op and understand the program. Oops. Yeah. I'm sorry, going the wrong way. Now we're gonna switch gears from programs from that the co-ops have designed to the SNAP Incentives Program, which is um, a publicly or privately funded program that matches consumer SNAP dollars for fruits and vegetables. Essentially people getting 50% off of their fruits and vegetables when they shop um, and use their SNAP card. Um, this program was established initially in farmers markets. I imagine some of you are very might be very familiar with this program. Also CSAs, um, and in some states they're allowed in grocery stores and co-ops. Um, the state requirements and grant parameters differ between states, and um, for some it's local only. And some allow uh, items uh, beyond fruit and veggies. For example, in Maine, they allow dairy. In Massachusetts, they allow seafood. Um, the goal of the SNAP incentives program is to increase access of fruits and vegetables to low-income consumers, to increase the consumer base and sales for local farmers, and to keep more money in the local economy. So what are we doing to expand SNAP incentives in our region? Well, currently six member co-ops of NFCA are offering uh, programs in Maine and New Hampshire. And NFCA is working with some grant partners uh, within the New England region. Um, and we're hoping to establish pilot programs for four co-ops in Vermont and one co-op in Rhode Island uh, pending uh, grant approval. Um, and this will allow us to uh, bring um, SNAP incentives to Vermont and Rhode Island for the first time as far as in our co-ops. And really exciting is that recently um, New Hampshire passed state funding for future SNAP incentive programs, which means in the state of New Hampshire, um, co-ops and, and grant partners are going to be able to draw funds not only from the federal government, but also from the state government to further fund these programs, which is just really exciting news. Um, and what we find too, is that these programs are incredibly um, successful at selling more produce um, and getting more healthy fruits and vegetables you know, into the homes of people who um, have limited access. So Canover Food Co-op in, um, New Hampshire and Vermont, they um, 
they launched their program in 2018. After one year, uh, they saw an 11% increase in produce sales for like $18,000 in increased sales of fruits and vegetables. And in 2020, they tripled that with a 34% increase of SNAP produce sales. And although I don't have the exact dollar amount, um, you know, they tripled the percentage, which I would think means they probably did in the neighborhood of $50,000, although I won't quote me on that. But um, so that program has been hugely successful. And they're also finding that it really helps cultivate an atmosphere around affordability for fresh foods and increase accessibility of local farm products in our co-ops. Alexis, I'm gonna pause you because there was a question before. Oh yeah. Let's see. You mean, I think that was me. Question? Yeah, I think it was you. Yeah. I, so I just, a couple slides, I didn't want to interrupt you, but a couple slides back, you were talking about your outreach um, to increase, you know, or to um, increase representation of other demographics that were, uh, you know, shopping at the co-op. And you mentioned SSI and SSDI, and I wasn't sure how exactly what that, I mean, I know what those programs are, but was it that you were doing outreach to folks in those programs or were you accessing something within those programs to help them, you know, afford food? How, how did, what did, great what, question. That's a great cl clarifying question. Um, what I'm, what I was talking about is uh, basically you know, these programs all have qualifiers, how you can get into the program. So if you are on the SNAP program, you can be uh, uh, in the food for all program or in the flower program, right? So what we did at Green Star is we extended our qualifiers to start including things like SSI and SSDI and uh, Pell Grant. So if anyone who is in those programs would also qualify for the flower program. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. And we did do some significant outreach to, uh, we were opening a store off the Cornell University campus at the time, uh, a satellite store, when we did this. And we we worked with uh, Cornell Financial Aid and a student group to determine what would be the best qualifier for students, because there's a lot of food insecurity on that college campus, as well as campuses across the country. And so we really wanted to pick something effective and they felt Pell Grant was the best way to go. Got it. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Great. And then our third type of initiative is unique partnerships with farmers. So over the years, you know, and even more recently, we've developed a lot of different kinds of partnerships and co collaboration with local farmers. You know, things like microloans for hoop houses, warehouse space, and that kind of thing. And now what we're seeing is more and more unique partnerships over time with some of these being very specifically focused on our healthy food access and diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Um, and others are being created to really form mutually beneficial economic-based relationships with our farmers as well. Um, so uh, for our first example, the Brattleboro Food Co-op in Vermont is now partnering with Susu Community Farm. So Brattleboro has a working member program where you know, their members can volunteer and earn a co-op discount. And so now, their members who would like to work at Susu Community Farm and volunteer there can get a co-op discount. And Brattleboro is doing a lot of work around diversity, equity, and inclusion right now. And they really wanted to partner with Susu uh, Community Farm as an uh, Afro-Indigenous stewarded farm and land-based healing center in Southern Vermont that's really working hard to elevate Vermont's land and foodways. So it's a really cool partnership um, between the two organizations. Um, Franklin Community Food Co-op um, has a really interesting proposal on the table right now. Now they're um, located in Massachusetts. And um, so I don't know how many people are familiar with um, Atlas Farm. They're an organic farm in Deerfield, Massachusetts. So right now there's a proposal um, the co-op members will need to vote on that proposal um, for Franklin uh, Community Food Co-op to lease and run 
the Atlas um, farm stand, which will allow Atlas to focus more on their building their wholesale business. And it's really cool because um, the current farm stand has a very strong local farmer mission, as does Franklin Community Co-op. And um, so these two organizations coming together just are going to strengthen that. And the cool thing about Atlas is that, you know, they sell their own local uh, produce at the farm stand, but they have a range that they don't go, they sell local produce and uh, products from within a 200 mile range of the farm stand and no further. So this is going to be both a beneficial economic proposition for the two organizations, as well as a very mission oriented one for both of them. Um, and like Brattleboro, um, Franklin has been doing a lot of work around diversity, equity, and inclusion and justice um, in the past few years. And you know, their efforts too are to help build awareness of their membership around historical injustices. And one of the things they um, did um, in that light was to invite uh, Leah Penniman, the co-founder of Soul Fire Farm that Bonnie talked about earlier, to, um, to speak with them at their virtual annual meeting. Now, Leah and her sister have actually done a, a virtual keynote address. Um, and so Leah actually did a, an introduction to that keynote, and then they showed the keynote to the members. And it was great because this uh, keynote actually weaves the history and, um, and structural reality, realities of racial injustice um, in the food system. And they talk about past and present frontline communities who have mobilized for food and land sovereignty, and then talk about how we can build um, a food system based on justice, dignity, and abundance for all members of our community. So um, this was just a really excellent way for them to build the awareness within their membership of these efforts. And lastly, at um, Green Star, um, we have a program, um, there's a program in Ithaca, New York called Healthy Food for All. And it's run through Cooperative Extension. And the person who created the program was actually the membership manager of Green Star before I was. And um, when they created this program, it's a subsidized CSA program that currently works with 10 local farms to provide fresh fruits and vegetables to those facing financial difficulties. And they use a flip side sliding fee scale. So the participants in the program pay a lower price for the CSA and Healthy Food for All then pays the difference to the farmer. So the farmer makes their fair share for the CSA. So it's a really great relationship. When the program started, they wanted their participants to be able to pay via SNAP and they didn't have a way to do that. So they came to Green Star and we said, sure, have, have folks pay here. And then once a month, we send a check to Healthy Food for All oh, to the money that we've collected for these baskets. Um, in turn, when we developed the flower program, we worked with HFFA and they said, and we realized they, it should be a, an automatic qualifier for the flower program. And HFFA has worked really hard to streamline the qualification process on, on their side to get people into the flower program as quickly as possible. So it's been a really nice kind of win-win situation for the two organizations in really um, helping both programs um, grow and prosper. And um, before I turn this over to Bonnie, um, I just wanna say Liz Karabinakis, who is the woman who spearheaded this program and is uh, still running the program, told, was really excited that we were gonna talk about this um, today because her goal is to have an HFFA like everywhere, right? And so they're celebrating their 15th anniversary and they're having some celebratory events this fall and they're gonna announce their five-year goals. And um, so she said that interested folks can sign up for their mailing list. And if anyone wants to learn more about the program, there's info on the website, which they can also reach out to Liz. So I'm gonna put 
their links and um, Liz's contact information in the chat. So people can access that if they're interested in finding out more. And she's also going to do a workshop at NOFA New York this winter, where she's going to do a deeper dive into the mechanics of the program for anyone who's interested. So with that said, I'm going to turn this over to Bonnie. Thanks, Alexis. Um, I wanted to see, does anyone have questions? I, no, thank you for that question before, Rosemary. Uh, we talked about a lot of details. <laughs> a little bit of a whirlwind tour of some of the stuff that we're doing. So I was wondering if anyone has questions, you could either type in the chat, raise your hand, make yourself apparate so we can see you. I'll just pause for a minute. Yes, Rosemary, I see your hand raised. I was waiting to see anyone. I know, but, uh... I am too, yeah. Well, maybe <laughs> while she's asking your question, Think about other questions y'all have. Yes, if everyone else has questions, please um, raise your hand or put it in the chat. I um, how I, I know you said that, that there's a whole other uh, you know conference workshop coming up about how this program works, but how is how is the HFFA program itself funded? Is it grant funded? I mean, it looks like. Thank you. I meant to say that. Yeah, it's granted through um, actually a lot of donations and grants, local grants. Uh, they may have some grants from outside the local area. I'm not sure on that. But one of the things that they do to fundraise is they do community dinners at the 10 farms. So each month there'll be a dinner at one of the farms and they bring in a local chef who then uses you know, food from the farm and creates an amazing meal and they bring in local wines and local ciders and beers, all kinds of local stuff. And it's just a celebration with music and stuff. And that's um, a significant fundraiser for them. It's really cool. Wow, cool. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else have questions? Joan, Carol, EY. Nancy and Joe. <laughs> Good to see you're you. Brutal. You're, bru you're brutal. You're brutal with this. I'm not going to let you. I love it. No, I yeah. love it. The other, the other in the workshops cyberspace. were not drawing people in, and I resented it. I'm glad you asked us to turn on our cameras. I mean, so thank you. Yes. Um, um, I wanted more of a comment that I really appreciate the, the roundup uh, programs that I've been seeing in the co-ops, because I really think it educated the consumer about other nonprofits that were in the community, you know, like the homeless and the whatever, the boys club and, and NOFA, you know, we got like $3,000 one month in January from the roundup. So um, I'm, I'm really happy to see that um, uh, continuing in, in these co-ops. So I saw it in Brattleboro, they had a different thing, something with beans, you voted with beans or something like that. So um, I, I love that, that education angle from, uh, from the co-ops. That they're not so insular. Insular? What's that word? You know, yeah, they, yeah. They, there is a community thing going on there. Thank you. Thanks, Joan. And and I think you know that's a great. I love that you brought that up because beyond just the amount of money going to local nonprofits, which is substantial, um, also the education right around these are partners in our community. We are not working in by ourselves. We are part of this other this network of community players working on mutual aid working to meet our community's needs so yeah thank you for bringing that up and i posted in the chat one of our member food co-ops hanover that has multiple stores they have through their roundup program their members have donated a million dollars to local nonprofits in the region through their roundup program so that's substantial right that's a profound economic impact boosting up local nonprofits in their area and the co-op is just acting as a co-creator of value, right? It's something that their members are opting to do and their shoppers are opting to do at the register while learning about the community partner. And, you know, a lot of these co-ops, as you alluded to, Joan, they, they kick it off with information in newsletters, links to their website. They have folks from the organization come in and table so you get to know about what is happening in your community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm famous for that, for what, when they're saying, would you like to round up? And I'd say, well, what is that organization? Well, what do you know? And so I make the, the, the cashier person go, uh, 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 and it, it kind of forces them to educate themselves too, so they can 
pass that information on to the consumer, like, you know, because they didn't know what NOFA was. I'm like, you don't know what NOFA is? <laughs> I'll go get you some brochures or anything. So, um, oh man, uh, Joe, you're going to grow educate. them. You're, they're going to be NOFA put... converties by the time they are done talking with you. Well, I think but... it's important for the clerks to understand, you know, who they're trying to represent at that split second decision. Would you like to round up? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's in the title, like, you know, Conquered Homeless. It's in the name, but NOFA? If the person, uh, NOFA, and people, the consumer, like, oh, no, tomorrow. But if the person right. could, could anyway, educate the, the, the clerks, I think is important. Like you said, yeah. tabling and that kind of stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. That's such a good segue. I only have two slides left, and then I want to just keep talking. So, you know, what you said about information, we, you know, the pandemic was such an interesting and terrible lens to see and remind ourselves of how important it is to have trusted places where we can get information in our communities. Um, and, and that, you know, you're talking about education at the register, these conversations, it really reminded us of this need for these trusted places where we know the information is coming from a local source and have access to resources. And one example of this is a lot of our co-ops when, I think everyone was pausing and waiting for someone to have an answer, right? Like, wow, this is an unprecedented global pandemic. Who's going to tell us what to do? And our national leadership was certainly not at the time. And um, I think what our co-ops did was one of our co-ops, Franklin Community Co-op, which you can see there, they have an awesome new window where you can access food right off the street of downtown Greenfield. They created a mutual aid network and the co-op actually housed that. So you put in what your need was, or you put in what you were willing to volunteer, and they would match up people's abilities to volunteer with what people needed. So you could, um, if you were immunocompromised, you could get someone to go in and shop for you, a neighbor, someone you didn't know, a stranger. And they actually convened and, and set up this mutual aid network. Um, other co-ops became part of or supported mutual aid networks that were already happening in their communities in response. Um, but it was just an excellent reminder that we, you know, if, if we have these gathering spaces in our communities, that also can pivot quickly to be like, oh, we're not being told what to do. We don't have to wait on a, someone from outside of our community to give us the corporate okay to do things like spend money to make a bigger lobby, to spend profit, to cut a window in for ordering to make, I mean, our co-op general managers got super creative with like space heaters and tents and thinking of all the ways that, that folks could safely shop and to keep both their staff safe, the farmers and producers that were dropping off food to the stores safe and the customers safe, especially when there was limitations of like, some of our co-ops are fairly tiny and they would have limits of five shoppers. Yeah. And so there was lines, right? So figuring out, okay, well then how do we keep people warm? How do we keep people happy? How do we create volunteers um, for that can go in and shop? And so, you know, these are just examples of like, we need these hubs. We need community hubs that are meeting people's needs. And I think one of the things that came up, one of the co-ops was, um, you know, when, when there was restrictions on people being able to leave their homes in general, they would go to the co-op and it was like the community gathering space and people wanted to talk for hours. So the co-ops, because that's what happens in food co-ops often when you go in. And so that was a bit of a challenge of like, whoa, wow, we really are this resource center and community gathering space. How do we figure out ways for folks to safely do this? Um, which was a little bit of a challenge, right? But, but the flexibility of being a people-centered business so that they could pivot. And, and they also came to understand, right? we, the, the community gathering space is both our physical, it's fulfilling a physical need for us, for food, for information, and also an emotional need and a sense of belonging that we all have, um, especially in this time that we are more isolated. So our co-ops definitely saw that throughout the pandemic. And it was just sort of a reminder to some that some folks that weren't either shopping regularly at the co-ops, a number of food co-ops got new members or got people that never stepped foot in a food co-op before because they said, this is the only place I feel safe shopping. And 
Um, we heard, I heard from a number of friends who were shopping at the local chain stores that shall go unnamed, but their headquarters are in Europe now, that um, they, they told their workers, don't wear masks because we don't want customers to get spooked. We don't want to lose money, right? Is that centering the health and well-being of their employees? No. Is that centering the health and well-being of their, of their shoppers? No. That's about profit as the bottom line. Um, so, you know, we did more people learned about food co-ops and stepped foot in the door and then we're like joined up because of that. So yes, the community hub function is really important in thinking about how do we, how do we continue this piece of meeting unmet needs in our communities. And finally, as we're wrapping up here. Oops, sorry, my cursor is where it shouldn't be. Okay. Um, just, you know, a reminder of, I don't know if, about you all, but we, you know, this, this, the last couple of years has certainly been an emotional roller coaster, right? Where there's times of hardship and distress and mourning and hopelessness. And then also times of seeing incredible, unprecedented collaboration and cooperation. And just a reminder that we're all in this together, all of us, right? We're in this together. And that we desperately need solutions for our communities that put people before profit, that are rooted and are accountable to us, and that are keeping economic infrastructure like grocery stores. They're not gonna close their doors and move out of our communities overnight when they're not making enough profit, which has happened all across the country, particularly in um, marginalized communities, right? That are going to, strengthen our local economy and not screw over farmers. There are other chain stores that source local and now they know they know local's hot, right? And they put local in their advertising. But when they change their sourcing requirements and local farmers and producers can't meet them, how much energy and time and resources do you think they invest to helping make that happen and helping the producers? They, none or very little, right? And so thinking about the flexibility of being willing to work with farmers, teaching our food co-ops, teach about food safety, packaging, labeling to folks that are creating um, new products, you know, value-based products, value-added products for the first time. So how can we work together to build a better and more sustainable food system and economy? I, <laughs> I just keep going back to like, it, we need this, we need an alternative to the way things have been done, right? To business as usual, that is going to center our needs and center the needs of farmers. And so thinking about how we're in this together, how, how we can help each other meet our unmet needs and put ownership and control, that's super important, back into the hands of our communities where we are able to work together to to if a local business is doing something and you're a collective owner with your neighbors to be able to have the voice, right? That Joan mentioned, the voice and the vote. Our co-ops throughout the, some of them have been open, the co-op of my community has been open 80 years. So throughout time, there's been times when the co-op has maybe veered off from its vision and it, slightly and the members let them know, let the management and let the directors know like, whoa, we're not doing what we said we we're gonna be doing, right? To be able to have that voice and rally together and be like, okay, let's go back. What, what do we need to do to set ourselves right, right? So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for being part of this conversation. And I wanna hear more from you all because I'm so curious as to like why you're here and, and what you're thinking about in terms of what are your needs or what are needs in your community and how can we think creatively and use the cooperative structure to meet those needs? I just want to say thank you both for this presentation. It was, it was very informative and uh, I, I learned a lot. So thank you so much. And uh, of course we have uh, we've you know, 10 minutes before it's 8.30. Uh, I think you know, it would be great to continue the conversation. Um, oh, we have a comment. <laughs> oh, John, did you motivated to break down and join? Oh, 
I just I just haven't been a member. I haven't been a member all these years. I shop there and they are you a member? I'm like, no, not yet. I kept putting it off and putting it off. It's like, all right, now join, you know, gosh. <laughs> gosh. Awesome. It's just, it's just there was some management years ago that I just didn't like the way she was running the co-op. I didn't like where she was spending the money and I didn't like how she was treating our local farmers and you know, gossip stuff. And I just I just didn't want to join it. But I went there, you know, not to buy all my groceries, but you know, bulk and stuff. But uh, there's the, the place has come a long way, and it's about time I joined. So thank you. I'll go join this week. <laughs> Give them my hundred bucks. That's awesome. That's great, John. Yeah, and that's the thing is like, right? Cooperatives are made up of people and humans in your community, right? So it represents yeah. the weakness and and the strength of your neighbors, <laughs> and and we need to push each other, right? And mm -hmm. I think that's what's great about being part of an association is that our co-ops, this photo, for example, of Monadnock Food Co-op staff, this is part, we do a photo competition during co-op month for our members and we give them prizes from co-ops like La Riojana, which is cooperatively produced wine from Argentina and Equal Exchange, which is cooperatively sourced and produced and distributed um, coffee and chocolate, right? So, and Cabot, right? And Organic Valley, these, these cooperatives in our region. And so we get, we put pressure, we get some good peer pressure on our food co-ops to be like, show your co-op pride, to talk, talk about the cooperative difference, um, create healthy food access programs. And I think there's a lot of power in that, in that peer pressure. So um, Joan, like you're saying that sometimes individuals can do things that might not be <laughs> meeting your highest aspiration. And I would say like, yes join and then vote right like that's yeah. more powerful oh i thought about getting on their boards and all that kind of stuff there you know you I, I like to get up there but anyway yeah. oh but i love the monadnock co-op another thing i think is is atmosphere i love to eat my lunches there because it's that glass wall and all that and the concord co-op has a nice nice location to eat your foods too so i think that helps you know to make a place inviting and warm comfort food and and then go sit down and, and mingle and community and so I think that's, you know, I like to see that it's progressing. Yeah. Joan, you're oh, awesome, awesome for participating. I appreciate you. And Carol <laughs> too. It's so nice to be able to see people's faces. And I know. I love the cameras on. I think it's important. Yeah. Too bad you didn't have more participants. I guess people are going to watch us at a later time. But Oh, yes. Oh. We we hope that there was pre-registration of hundreds of people like there are for books. <laughs> right? And they're just waiting to not watch it at 7 p.m. Well, it'll be out there forever. That's a comfort to know these are all recorded. That's good right. these days. I'm glad these things are getting uh, archived. So I'm curious if anyone, is there anything that you'd like to see from your local co-op in terms of, you know, food security, healthy food access or whatever that, you know, maybe you've thought of or something, but you don't see the co-ops, you know, doing. Is there some way we can improve? I like it when the co-op um, managers or whatever get out there, like the guy from the uh, Hanover co-op, the Dartmouth co-op, he's, he goes to a lot of meetings, you know, he's very visible. I forget his name off the top of my head, but I like it when they get out and, and oh, spread God. the word with, you know, with their own personalities. Do you, do you know his name? Anybody can help me with his name? The current general manager is Paul and terry appleby was a general manager for decades and you'd always bump into him with he would be putting the shopping carts back he was always out mingling so i don't know not, if you're who, which not one the manager uh, someone higher than that someone that really runs that whole co-op because they, they've got three stores now right right no the general manager is currently paul and the oh, former i guess it is paul you're right i think it is yeah. paul and okay. he's very personable and i appreciate that he gets out there he goes to other meetings like with Food Alliance and stuff, and he's participating in the in the community and 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 you know drawing us in like oh okay, that's great to hear. Yeah, getting I mean that's honestly one of the difference makers into how successful these needs based discounts and healthy food access programs mm -hmm. are is how much is the co op leaving the doors of the store right and heading out and having staff at meetings. Mm -hmm. And one cool story about that came from Brattleboro Food Co-op where they were designing meals with the local um, food distribution center. And they were they wanted to team up on like education initiatives and cooking classes based on uh, lower cost products in this store. And they got feedback that some of the um, 
the community members that were being served by this organization don't have access to a stove. And so they were like, oh, well, we need to design crock pot. They said, well, what do we use? Crock pot. So then they changed the recipes to be recipes that you can make with crock pots, right? So just know that without hearing and having that direct relationship with the service organization, they might not have received that feedback. So the more you get out there and, and hear directly from the people being served or the people, the organizations directly working with stakeholders, then you get you get kind of like, oh, let's tweak this a little bit. So I have a question oh. sort of unrelated, I guess, or related. Um, but what would so what would be a reason that a co-op does not join neighboring food co-op? Like, is there like I know there are, like um, Joan had mentioned, and I think there's um, a co-op out in Albany called Honest Sweet that I don't think is part of your association. And I love Honest Sweet so much. I shop a family in Albany, and we shop there all the time. But I wanted to know, like, you know, why why aren't all these co-ops in the association? I don't know if it's a weird question to ask, or if there's like some sort of thing like um, ask it. <laughs> I want to know. Yeah, it's a good question. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary, which seems like to us working as staff, I've been here almost all 10 years, it seems like a long time, but the reality is, is we're a fairly new organization. And so, and we, we started in just New England before expanding to New York. Part of it was that before the pandemic, we really believed in visiting all of our co-ops, interacting regularly, that all of our food co-ops were members would have the ability to, to come to trainings that we hosted and come to our annual meetings. So that means really, we don't want anyone driving more than six hours. And some of the co-ops from Maine, bless them, Carpool and or Ithaca, yeah. <laughs> come and stay overnights, right? It's a little bit of a stretch. So we're partly geographically limited for some areas of like far, far off Maine or mm -hmm. New York. We hope, I mean, during the pandemic, what was made clear to us is that a lot of people come in through Zoom and we've bumped up participation with other staff. Like we've done bulk bulk staff trainings, which we were not doing before, prepared foods department. You know, two of the departments in our co-ops that were hit hardest by the changes in health and safety for shopping during the pandemic. So now, you know, we really, we would love, honestly, and we would love uh, Concord to join. And we have had preliminary conversations with both of those co-ops. So if you're a shopper there, say, hey, join the Neighboring Food Co-op Association. Yeah, but I got to be a member before they really take, you know. There you go, Joan. I'm not a you're member like, yet. So I'm that is the a newest member. member. Right away. <laughs> right. yeah, definitely next time I'm in Albany, I am going to mention something. Because yeah. um, yeah. I think it's super important. I know they've been around for forever. But um, I do think it's really important for all the co-ops to sort of work together especially like so regionally and Albany being on the Massachusetts line, I think it's like really important, so. Yeah, and, and you know, Jesse and Joan. Having, having come from a co-op that was very far away, you know, a lot of it too, I think, cause we talked to other, co you know, we've talked to other co-ops kind of um, near us and that distance thing is a real big thing. But it's, you know, there's also a thing to be said, right? About, you know, each co-op is different too, and like the communication within the co-op can differ. And are the decision makers, you know, really hearing, well, not that it's decision makers because it's like the co-op, we make collective decisions, but is that communication of what NFCA is about, is that actually happening within the co-op? Which is why when other people can, you know, kind of join in and be part of that discussion and say, hey, why hasn't, you know, why hasn't Honest Weight joined NFCA? You know, the more people doing that, then it starts to get a little buzz around the co-op and that can grow. Okay. So, Carol, what you got? Um, actually, I'm trying to look at some of the links as far as, uh, doesn't seem to be any food co-ops relatively close to my area. Where are you? I, I actually, I went to school in Western Mass and I see a whole slew out there. Oh yeah, yep. Um, but I'm just north of Boston. So like the closest kind of seems to be Haverhill, which is a very north or Dorchester, which is very south. Dor oh, is it? Yeah, Dorchester is one of our startups and they their building is being built. You all should follow them if you want the incredible excitement of a new co-op. They put it, they're looking for a general manager and they're 
from day one, their entire vision has really been around uh, food, racial and economic justice. You know, that is their entire motivation for opening. So I'm so excited for, to, for them to find their first general manager and get the doors open. Yeah, I don't know if any that would be closer to you, but that's, you know, some of, we've got 10 startups, which is communities organizing that haven't yet opened. And I think we'll see even more of them, right? I've got probably 15 folks that have reached out to me over the last year being like, we want to start a food co-op in our community. So those are not listed right on the, on your website. Those the, are like, not listed. Yeah. Okay. It, it takes a lot of time and effort and yeah. resources yeah. to open a food. Wow. Company. They just got a, they got a hundred thousand dollar grant, huh? From this Cummings foundation. Yes. Yeah. They oh, are, from the Cummings foundation. Oh, yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah, I noticed that there the Eastern Mass is a little bit light on co-ops. So I was looking. I, I moved from Amherst, where I know there was one that was underway, um, yes. to Salem, where there doesn't appear to be one. But right. Well, yeah. um, the co-op that I, I believe will is one of our co-ops closest to opening is also Maynard, Massachusetts, Metro West of Boston. So yes. um, they are the Acibet Co-op Market, and so they have their general manager. They're doing final site negotiation stuff, and I'm hoping they're going to be opening as soon as early next year. Awesome. Just putting it out in the universe. Yeah. Come join. I'm a member. Come join. Yay. Yeah, Jesse. <laughs> yeah, their new general manager, Sam, is so fantastic. I'm so excited because they have background in construction management and food co-op general manager. So they're like, a magical unicorn of co-op GMs to find and hire as your first GM. Yeah. <laughs> and really all about um, healthy food access. Yes. Too. Yeah. Um, who would I get in touch with in regards to like the investment part? I'll um, post something in the chat right now. Yeah. And if you know folks, I've done that too, because I don't, I think you have to live in Massachusetts to invest. Maybe you don't, but I don't. But I've sent it to other folks. Um, Cause I'm on a, I'm on a. Th um, by January, I, I'm actually, a, I'm a certified financial planner. So I'm trying to plow through all the uh, regenerative um, investment arenas to kind of line up everything for, for me to give advice on. Because I, I just, I can't, majority of the green investing, I really don't care for. And this is stuff that I love. Yeah, you can see they've got an okra meter. <laughs> yeah. I just posted you the link and it says there's, but you, if you just follow it, you, there's, a, you can see the subscription agreement and um, I'll send you also information on investment you can talk to. Jenny, in, the meantime, the in the meantime, you can invest in your local farmers markets. Keep yeah, them rolling. Right. They need help. Um, what do you mean by invest? Um, uh, give them money. You know, give them. Um, oh, believe you me, I'm. I'm all. Uh, we have Lilac Hedge, which is incredible regenerative farm. And no, uh, I'm talking farmers markets. Sorry. I'm talking farmers markets, invest, you know, give donations to these farmers markets so they can do advertising. Um, they can buy uh, signage and, uh, you know, hire someone to do their marketing. You know, these little farmers markets need money. And, and I, I ran a bunch of them. I, I, you know, I do a, vol a lot of volunteering for them. And I also do tons of posts for them. So I, 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 I have 20 years of marketing. So I kind of just help with, with it. Awesome. Cool. Carol, did you see the link I posted? Yes. It's invest at, if you just email them or go to the, yeah. So we are a little past 8.30. I want to respect everyone's time. Um, thank you. Uh, it was a, just a wonderful presentation. It's so, so informative. Uh, I, I, as I said, I learned a lot. Um, so thank you so much for all of that great information. And thank you to everyone who came out tonight uh, to hear the presentation. Um, and I, I dropped a link to a survey so you could um, uh, give feedback. We love your feedback. Uh, Jesse, if you happen to have that queued up, you can post that again uh, in the chat. 
Um, and I also wanted to advise everyone, you probably know this by now, but you can save the chat. So like all of these great links or things that people have said, you can save that as a text file on your computer. And you do that by going to the chat window. And then there are like three little dots and you click that. Um, I never find this. I don't know what you're talking about. Three dots. Okay, ready? So click at the, at the bottom of the Zoom screen, click the chat window. I did. Dot. Okay. Now you're gonna go to um, uh, like at least on my computer, there's sort of the, the top part where you see people you know, putting in messages and then there's the bottom part where you can type a message. And to the right, there are these three little dots. Not on mine. But that's okay. Little. I'll figure it out some other way. Huh. Yeah. Well, I'm going to save the chat. And then um, my, let me, Joan, my email is. So the chats are never going to be available with any of these workshops unless we clicked on this because I, you know, every time I'm like, ah, I can't, you know, it's not on mine. That's all, but anyway, yeah, some I'll, it's all right. So we'll be losing the chats on, on a lot of these. Okay. Well, I've seen in some, maybe, I don't know if Jason's here and can comment, but I, I've seen in some recordings that the chat actually shows up in the recording, but I am not. That's what I was hoping. Quite you clear on <laughs> what settings um, have been, uh, you know, turned on for this particular recording. Um, right. So it may or may not be, but I just saved it and I can send it to you. <laughs> no, it's okay. I know how to find it because they're also in the program. If I ever wanted to reach Bonnie or Alexis, I know how to okay. find it. Uh, excellent. Thank Wonderful. You. Well, thank you so much. Uh, again, this was so great. And I, I really hope a co-op opens near me. <laughs> <laughs> and we thanks everyone too. for your participation. Yes, Wonderful. thank you. And thank Round you Nova for applause for the presenter. Yeah. Yay! Yes, Jesse. I love PowerPoints. It's, it's <laughs> changed the whole lecture dynamic, hasn't it, with PowerPoints? Oh, just... <laughs> and then a slideshow. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.